Uh, sir, the, the title of my talk is uh, even though I cover IoT security in detail, I just said the role of trusted elements in IoT security. I'll be explaining what are these trusted elements. Sure, sir. You're free to, uh, you, you have the entire freedom to facilitate the session. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. So and uh, we will reserve the questions towards the end of the session, sir. You can proceed with your uh, lecture and uh, towards the end we will have the questions, sir. Definitely, sir. Okay. Sure, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, sir. So good afternoon, all of you. Uh, so my objective uh, for the today's uh, presentation is to introduce you to the world of IoT. I, I hope as part of the current uh, cyber security forum, uh, I don't know whether this what is IoT has been introduced or not, but definitely as as for the continuation of my presentation, I, I introduce you briefly on what is IoT and how it is different. Uh, from the traditional internet and what kind of security uh, that this IoT needs so that the systems that are coming up will, will uh, be really uh, useful for, for our benefit. So let's look at uh, when, when this particular term has been started and who has actually uh, initiated this. <coughs> There's uh, one, uh, Kevin Armstrong in 1990, nine is basically working in supply chain management. okay so he actually referred and used the term first time uh, called internet of things that time is actually referring to the uniquely identifiable objects because his his major uh, job is basically supply chain uh, so the the goods that go out of the go down and uh, that reaches at discrete places you should be able to clearly identify each one of the baggage that it goes out. So he was referring to kind of RFID technology there at that point of time and their virtual representation in the internet. Like suppose I have certain uh, 10 bags of the goods sent from location A to location B. Each bag will be will be tied with an RFID and each RFID will be mapped onto the internet saying that uh, this particular bag with so and so RFID will reach location A. Or similarly, for the another bag, it reaches the location B. So, at what happens at the receiver end, and uh, for the for the guys who has actually sent from the source also, as and when it reaches the data that the particular bag with such so and so RFID has reached location A will get updated on the internet. So that gives a kind of information for the both source and uh, destination, and also tracking will become very easy. So he was referring to that kind of structure in 1999 and he coined the word Internet of Things. But now it has been much, much advanced. It's not that confined to basically an identification alone. It's the advanced connectivity of the devices, various devices that we use in our daily life. Okay, suppose you take an example of uh, everybody's home that we live in every day. We have refrigerators, we have TVs, we have fans. Is imagine, a, imagine a situation where all of them are connected to the internet and you have flexibility to operate based on your need. So the kind of flexibility and the kind of convenience this technology brings is, 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 uh, is like much more than, than that we think. So in the current day scenario, Internet of Things refers to the advanced connectivity of the devices systems and services and it also involves a lot of protocols what are the protocols we are going to see briefly to understand iot in depth okay it also covers various domains it's not only uh, because because the nature the overall objective of iot now is now is connecting everything everywhere so when you have such flex flexibility of connecting everything everywhere your application areas are only limited by kind of sensing that you have kind of act a uh, kind of control that you can do so the domains and applications are not limited it can be applied in various domains let us see briefly uh, what are the estimates that people are telling okay so uh, earlier they were used to talk about uh, 2020 uh, by 2020 or 20 million devices well, but we have not reached to that mark uh, we may be now current estimates are for the 2030. Now the 2030 estimate says by 2030, 
you may have devices ranging from 25 billion to 65 billion anything in between these many number of devices will get connected to the internet okay so that's the new estimate so if you see the kind of technologies that is involved it's an interdisciplinary uh, technologies that makes iot reliable they are networking protocols they are for mems for sensors the basic transducer and also the wireless connectivity analytics cyber uh, security and uh, web development it, it involves various disciplines of engineering to work together to bring out an iot solution so let us look at how data flows because before going to this data flow model one more important thing that we have to clearly understand here is when we talk about traditional internet what was happening is the devices that were becoming part of the traditional internet were the devices that were operated by the human beings okay suppose if you look at a desktop you look at a laptop you look at a mobile or a pad a tab all of them generally were operated by the human beings and that's the part of the classical network when it comes to the uh, era of internet of things what what was the difference that actually it brings is the devices may or may not be operated by the human beings they are independent devices like they take a classic example of a tv which is ip enabled okay tv at least we can we can control the remote but as a device uh, if you see uh, it, it 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 can automatically become part of internet okay and uh, if you see another uh, simplest device like if i want to measure temperature in a particular location i have a temperature sensor connected to the internet so in this this kind of devices generally won't be operated by human beings okay and they are independent devices independent devices so the main purpose of these devices whatever we are talking about in internet of things are multifold one is to basically connect the physical world into the cyber world like monitoring all your environmental parameters suppose in case of uh, basic uh, bridge health monitoring you have Uh, tran- uh, sensors for monitoring the vibrations and all that gets connected to the internet. So it's it's many many such types of devices will become part of internet. So, so we need to understand clearly one one particular difference between the traditional internet and this is the devices may or may not be operated. Mostly you can consider are not operated by human beings. Will become part of the internet. So when how that these devices will join the internet let us see how the data and how what kind of networking okay is is being implemented in uh, internet of things so if you see this particular diagram this actually gives you the iot data flow model if you see on left hand side of it okay i, I have a bigger box in a light blue color if you clearly observe and within that i have dark blue mal three boxes are there and each box is contains three symbols okay so each box can be considered as the end device or thing that we are talking about in internet of things the thing that we are talking about so the each device consists of three basic building blocks if you observe clearly one is the sensor or actuator is represented by this symbol second is the processing element and the third is the communication transceiver so any end device will have these three basic building blocks that is part of so one is the sensor or actuator the purpose of it is to either sense the parameter that is intended for or to take a control suppose if i want to switch off the light if i want to reduce the ac temperature okay such things in any of these things is is this building blocks that suffices and then you have a processing element why do you need this processing element there are two fold for it one is the output of the sensing a uh, uh, control element has to be controlled by some application so uh, the output that comes in uh, raw bits has to be converted into engineering units and then you have third block of communication block so the communication block will generally works on a particular communication standard so you have a 
data frame formats that is compliant to that particular communication standard has to be built by this particular processing element. So the processing element in an end device has two major roles. One is basically to interface with the sensor or actuator. In case of sensor, you get the raw data, converting it to engineering units and putting it into the frame that is supported by the communication interface that the particular end device has. And the second is, is facilitating the communication device to basically push the data in the prescribed format. These two are the basic objectives of the processing unit. And the third one is communication transceiver. This facilitates data to be uh, transported to the next level. I'm talking about next level now. What is this next level? Next level. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Audible, sir. Yeah, yeah. The next level is basically, we, we call it as, suppose if you take in the traditional internet, uh, I, I'll, I'll take an analogy between traditional internet and IoT things now. Uh, uh, the end things in the traditional internet, let's assume, the systems that we work in offices. Okay, so the, all the systems in any office will form a local area network. So this, this first box on left hand side can be analogously compared to a local area network. And then the, the device shown in the second block can be considered as your router that is connected to the public internet. Okay, so the information from each computer through a localized network will go to your office router. From office router, which is connected to the internet IP backbone, and data can be transmitted to any system that is connected over internet in the world. Okay, in the traditional internet analog. Whereas when it comes to Internet of Things, similar thing will happen, but the kind of networks are different. So the device that we have shown in the second block, we refer this most of the uh, in a general terminology as the gateway. Okay, in gateway, what will happen? Gateway, there are once again three basic building blocks that constitutes the gateway. One is a processing element as shown in the middle. The second one is one communication interface, which is compliant to the end devices communication interface. Okay, so what will happen? This gateway will form a local network that is using the communication interface supported by the end devices. So there are various protocols defined for this. The most popular and the most famous and the protocol that actually made us to talk about IoT is there's a standard by IEEE called IEEE 802.15.4, which is a low power personal area network standard meant for transmitting low data over a wireless link. Okay, the, the, the data rates maximum supported by this particular protocol is 250 kbps, whereas it operates in three frequency bands. Okay, and uh, the most popular and free frequency band is 2.4 to 2.48 per gigahertz, which is called ISM band. That it is most, it supports that with 250 kbps. So, once I typically define 802.15.4 physical and Mac layer specification, there is a, uh, some, a list of companies has formed an alliance called JITI. They adopted this standard and built the network and application. So GP is one of the first, one of its first kind of protocol that was actually developed, designed and developed for the networking of such devices. Uh, initially, we used to call them at a wireless sensor networks because the, the, the basic communication mechanism is wireless and uh, it supports sensor and actuator networks. So uh, GP made wireless sensor networks possible. Then, uh, IETF, which is responsible for ma uh, drafting and managing internet standards for TCP, IP, and application, uh, application layer, uh, as adapted 15.4, and uh, they thought, why, 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 we, why should uh, not we transport IP uh, data ground onto this particular MAC and file? Then uh, there is a little uh, uh, kind of difference between the, the datagram that IP size and the maximum frame size that 15.4 max supports. 
the datagram size is about 1580 bytes whereas uh, the maximum frame size of uh, uh, 15.4 is 128 uh, bytes accordingly then they thought about uh, uh, bringing an additional layer between ip and this 15.4 mac and size and uh, they they brought specified that adaptation layer between this mac and file and uh, the adaptation layer roles and responsibilities on transmitter side is to defragment the ip packet and at the receiver side to reassemble the packet and also it does the header compression the set of standards defined by etf for that so that made us to talk about from wireless sensor networks to internet of things because each device IP is running on it. So that's why we are calling this as internet. And why, why it is called things? Because it is basically can be anything. So it can be uh, a small embedded device fits into the fan, makes fan to be available on internet. Okay, so that's the thing we call it as internet of things and devices. So this particular gateway will form a local area network based on one of these, either GP or 6 low fan, it can be Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. They form a local network. And then it collects data from all the devices that are part of the network. Okay. So it has another communication interface, which is IP communication. If, if your left-hand side communication interface is IP, then there is no problem that uh, uh, because you can directly pass that packet to the uh, right-hand side uh, channel and you can push data through the internet to the backend servers. If not, if it is Zigbee or something else, Bluetooth, then what this particular uh, compute engine does in the gateway is, it actually depacketizes this and frames into an IP packet and pushes the data onto the servers. Once the data is available on cloud or uh, HTTP servers, okay, you can run analytics and the results can be uh, made available through a mobile app, uh, results can be seen on a web application. So these and all are possible. So this particular diagram will, will clearly gives us the IoT data flow, how, how data exactly flows from a sensor to the servers, or either cloud servers or HTTP servers, and then how the information flows back. Okay, if, 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 if the result of any analysis is to take an action back on the field, then what will happen is the information flows back through this mode, through gateway, gateway to the end device. End device accordingly act and uh, control the particular actuator. It can be a solenoid, it can be an on-off actuator, it can be anything that you can change say, change the setting. So that that kind of action is possible. So this is what IoT data flow is. And if you look at the overall end device architecture, uh, you have sensors or actuators that are part of it. And uh, I said you need a computing element. Uh, see, one basic thing that we need to look at here is most of these IoT systems that we develop are meant for monitoring and control. Okay, yes. uh, kind of applications. So if you if uh, the basic criteria that you need to look at is the systems that you use for monitoring and control of such parameters should actually not consume more more power should also not consume more money because uh, the objective of this kind of monitoring and control is to effectively reduce the cost of overall operation and all okay that should not be taken away by the cost of the systems and the power that this, is, this monitoring system that consumes so uh, the the Power consumption also should be in limit. So the basic micro uh, processor or control uh, processor units generally needs to external peripherals and also microcontroller is one of the best fit. Nowadays, people are integrating more and more electronics into this because of the advances in uh, LSA fabrication techniques and all. So they have integrated RF transceiver also part of it. So system on chips are coming. So basic and the device will have a system on chip that is integrated with processing and communication element together and you have a sensor or actuator on that system and you need to power it 
it can be a battery based power or it can, if 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 the device is going to be deployed in control environment where power is available this could be a power that is taken from the source that you need to have a 230 volts and then down convert it to dc that is useful by the that can be supplied to the electronics on that board if not then you need to look at the power sources like energy harvesting sources okay. that gives you power to power the system suppose if it is deployed in uh, agricultural fields or if it is deployed into the bridges generally you will not have uh, power there then you need to look at how do you uh, power the system for the life term so some alternatives are solar based energy harvesting and vibration based energy harvesting you have to be looked into the power system architecture of your device still you have to maintain the tiny size because it has to fit into this device has to go and embed into the uh, actual system where you are going to deploy suppose uh, if if you are uh, put, if you are making it as a fan controller it should go and sit inside the fan with so it's a kind of embedded devices that goes into the thing and then the gateway will have uh, as as we discussed two kind of uh, communications uh, left hand side is meant for the end devices local area network and on right hand side is basically an ip network that pushes onto the this this thing and uh, to provide the kind of uh, uh, complete uh, local network uh, switching and routing functionality has to be provided by the this gateway software and it will have protocol conversion that is from the local area network protocol to the actual ip network and then it can even uh, uh, if you uh, if you are seriously looking at a secure solution it should have integrated firewall vpn and security integrated to actually secure the local area network so these are the basic software stack that should the gateway should support okay so if you overall look at the the the, the data flow in iot device okay you can actually categorize as your end devices then end devices to the gateway there is a local area network that we are talking about that can be considered as an edge network edge network is popularly used term here and then data goes to the gateway then you have a network to push that is basically an ip based network to push that data to the either http or cloud server this is the data flow laid out and on, on, on my right hand side, if you look at security, you would have heard about TLS protocol or HTTPS by now. So for the, from the gateway onwards, you have HTTPS, which can be enabled to basically securely transmitting data from the gateway to the cloud servers. Whereas when it comes down, even though there is a possibility for you to apply HTTPS and all, as I said earlier, these devices has to be built more cost effective than end devices. You will not think about having high amount of resources. That that causes two problems here. One is the cost of like like if you if you select a microcontroller which is having very high flash and RAM, what will happen is the cost of microcontroller goes up and the power consumption of microcontroller goes up because you, you might be using the complete uh, uh program to implement security and then the overall power consumption system also goes up so uh, looking at this we need to look at an optimal way of doing both so implementing https onto the end devices is overkill because of the resources so to replace that uh, there are various application layer protocols that were defined for iot like mptt and uh, coap by once again ietf itself so assuming like there these two protocols could not be adopted here our major focus of this talk is how to implement security at the end device level similarly the for the network that we are forming the local area network that we are forming so uh, then uh, we will look at the overall characteristics of this iot end device why we could not incorporate https and all that stuff so generally these devices will have a simple processing unit looking at the cost and the power consumption that the devices are constrained to and uh, because of this uh, small processing engine 
and we will uh, this is not a generic computing system like your desktop or laptop where you have external ram external or this kind of stuff okay this is a system on chip which integrates everything your flash your ram and all. so when you go for small processing you obviously limit yourself with respect to the memories that is available on that because of once again cost limitations and power limitations so the the overall constraint that these uh, these end devices are subjected to one is the availability of the processing power second is availability of the memory resources be it ram or ram and the third is availability of the power to power this particular system when you implement larger and larger applications these are the three constraints that these things are get subjected to in this constraint environment okay what are the security features that we need to implement particularly for this iot devices so the security features that we need to implement is device identification is one thing what these devices because this should have a unique logical and physical identifier to basically enable secure attestation and the second feature is device security so how do what do you mean by device security you should not uh, this device should not allow anybody because devices are tiny in size anybody can simply pick it and go but once they pick it and go and try to reverse engineer the device to get the actual uh, logic inside it this should this should have an anti tampering mechanism any kind of tamper this should detect and uh, it it should also come out with secure booting which we will be described in the later sessions and then the data inside the device should be protected and data in transit also needs to be protected that's the third feature required and the fourth one is logical access to the interfaces if you make more and more interfaces available outside in the product you, you are subjecting the device to the more and more attacks so you need to restrict access to these devices and uh, and also we need to make sure like if any particular port is made available to uh, to access it should be accessed through an authenticated person only so we should make sure like all this work then it should have a feature of uh, over the air firmware upgrade why this is required is uh, sometimes in once once the devices are deployed in field we may have to change lot of parameters like the 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 frequency at which the sensor data is being communicated and sometimes the sensors may drift due to the time some of the calibration factors we need to uh, enter into the device so that the output of the device is is uh, being calibrated so all that parameters you may have to or uh, and you may have to update it at later stage after the deployment so you need your device should provide a mechanism for the secure upgrade of this firmware and then uh, in case of any cyber security attack the event logging should be provided uh, should be done by the device and uh, this all helps us in in making uh, the communication secure from the device to the gateway and gateway so basically these are the security requirements that we need to address in iot and uh, various governments before we go and look into what are the things that are available to make uh, uh iot devices and and iot network secure uh, i would like to convey all of you that various governments are uh, seriously working on bringing some guidelines particularly for the iot devices because uh, the devices applications are not limited because uh, in healthcare the devices are getting penetrated in our daily life, daily lives iot is coming Uh, with respect to uh, like you would have seen some advertisement of an uh, AC manufacturer saying that it's an Wi-Fi enabled AC. You can switch on from anywhere. Suppose if you are reaching home uh, in another half an hour, if you would like to have your uh, room very cool, you can switch off from the laptop or mobile that that uh, this AC is connected. So the IoT is going everywhere, and the security of it is very important because. uh not only security privacy of it so every government is looking at uh giving some guidelines with respect to how these devices 
will will actually has to be designed before deploying so any device manufacturer or iot solution provider or uh, any telecom service provider offering service uh, should adhere to such guidelines i i have seen one of the recent guidelines uh, from australian government i just put it here this is only to to as basically enable you uh, to actually understand what are the things what are the principles that this governments are looking at suppose if you see the first principle they are looking at is no duplicate password or unique password okay so it says the, your system should have unique unpredictable complex and feasible to guess and uh, all the constraints they have put on particular password then second principle that is required is implement a vulnerability disclosure policy what does it mean uh, suppose if this is device is manufactured you can actually given a open challenge kind of thing if somebody can find a vulnerability in the device or something like that <coughs> then a lot of positive research security researchers can work on it and if they find any vulnerability you provide a publicly available contact to report that vulnerability then what will happen is uh, if you do such thing what will happen is you understand your strength of device in case of any vulnerabilities you, you actually further improve your uh, security so that the device cannot be vulnerable further so that's the advantage as a device manufacturing and the third principle that uh, uh, australian government set for this uh, all the device manufacturer service provider sees you need to have software uh, updation secure software updation as i said you need secure software up updation are including firmware firmware in the devices to make sure like uh, if you find any vulnerabilities you can uh, add patches to them any uh, sensor data frequency can be modified sensor calibration constraints will, can be added all that is the thing and also uh, if if your device could not update all that if, if you are simply removing end of policy should be there that's what this third part says and the uh, next one is secure store credentials is another principle they are expecting because what what do you mean by secure store credentials is you you should uh, uh, see your device should not have hard coded user passwords and all that because once you have hard, you hard coded user passwords uh through reverse engineering you can get them instead you should have a mechanism to generate uh to to generate uh, inside and store it securely so that reverse engineering should not enable them to get the things and then uh, next principle that uh, they have, they have given guidance for the manufacturers are ensure that personal data is protected because uh, iot devices are coming into personal space also so the personal data should uh only be collected if necessary for the operation of the device and the privacy settings on the device should comply into the privacy policy there there are australian government privacy policy india also, government also has got indian privacy policy so the uh, we should uh, the even while entering the personal data we should adhere to the uh, personal privacy policy and make sure like data in transit and data at rest are secure and then next principle that this is uh, uh, talking about is uh, minimize exposed attack surface this is basically to to reduce any accessible port onto the device that you are going to deploy okay so what will happen is uh, e even though you need one port keep it uh, in such a way that it will be only accessible through authenticated uh, access that's what it says then uh, ensuring communication security so you should make sure like the communication between devices is secure using the using the ways that are being defined by various pro, pro standard bodies and then uh, software integrity has to be ensured so how do you ensure software integrity you should have uh, kind of uh, asking the basic uh, you, uh, you should actually uh, measure the hash of it and make sure like this has is stored in a secure location whenever you try to run a software you can compare the hash of that and with the securely stored the hash and and see that whether uh, uh, any alteration has been done uh, from the trusted software that that's what you can do it
and then uh, next is make systems re resilient to the outages what do you mean by this see suppose uh, there will be a problems with respect to network connection availability with respect to the power of the device in such cases you should have a local uh, provision in the device to basically serve in those conditions also like uh, in case of network outing what you do is instead of uh, uh, transmitting data consistently you actually log the data inside when our network is available we'll do that but in case of power outages what it should have it should have a backup battery sufficient for a reasonably good amount of time so that when power comes back it should get charged okay, that's what is uh, system resiliency is and then uh, monitor the system telemetry data that is one of the principle they said and the next is make it easy for consumers to delete personal data suppose if he is is going to stop using the system and uh, throwing it out he should be able to easily uh, delete the data related to him his personal data and uh, throw it and then uh, make installation and the maintenance of devices easy because uh, that should involve minimal minimal steps uh using the best practice of uh, security and uh, usability point of view and there are various guidelines related to that that has to be followed then validate input data data received via user interfaces and uh, api interfaces and network interfaces should be validated so that the uh, there is no uh, malware or virus just comes and sits into the device so these are the 13 principles given as guidelines by the Australian government. So the IoT device manufacturers, IoT service providers and mobile application developers should comply to all these principles if they have to actually uh, sell their devices in Australia. Similarly, India also we may have to look at some kind of such uh, mechanism where uh, we can give such guidelines. So these guidelines are given let us see how all these can be achieved. We talked about there's uh, security requirements and some guidelines by Australian government. Is there any way that we can achieve? Before going further on, how, how do we take up onto the IoT? I would like to introduce a little onto the part of cryptography. See, the cryptography is uh, basically process of uh, uh, protecting the information by using various mathematical principles. Uh, like uh, the, the plain text will be converted into an unre un unreadable format by following the algorithm specified. Like if it is a symmetric key, uh, a symmetric key means the sender and receiver will share the same key, and uh, the plain text that the sender wants to send will be encrypted by the key. There is a set of steps defined by each algorithm. If you see the examples of the algorithm, there are DES, AES, ID, and many more are there. There are many more SIM ciphers are available. So each one has its own definition of what, what is the end results, like cipher text. AES, if you see, AES supports 128-bit key, 192-bit key, and 256-bit key. Based on, based on the key size that you use, you will have four basic operations like uh, there, there, there are uh, sub bytes, S box column, S box is one thing, add round key, one thing, mix columns operation, one thing, shift rows operation is there. Four basic operations defined in AES algorithm. These four basic operations will happen for 10 rounds for 128 bit key. And uh, key generation is a separate algorithm for this. From the main key, you generate, generate uh, round key for each of these rounds. Okay, so uh, the fourth operation is add round key. That, that's where after all these operations like shift rows, mix columns, and uh, uh, substitution box, you add the round key and that goes as input to the next round. So after doing these 10 rounds, your cipher text will be out from the plain text. That is the one which you communicate to the receiver. Okay, so from a plain text, you, you are uh, creating confusion and diffusion in many iterations. Finally, the data uh, looks uh, highly unreadable for a third party who does not have the same key. So at the receiver side, whoever has got key can follow the decryption algorithm with the, once again, key distribution there, uh, and then get the plain text that has been communicated by the sender. Whereas the basic challenge here is, in, in case of symmetry key, because the 
uh, sender and receiver has to use the same key. Uh, how do you distribute this key? That that has to be used by the receiver is the challenge. And the next type of cryptography algorithms that are available is public key systems. Whereas here you have a set of keys. One is called a secret key that is stored that will be with the sender always. He will not disclose his secret key to anybody. And he has another key called public key, which will be shared to all freely. So if you see the next two points, message encrypted with the secret key can only be decrypted with the corresponding public key. What this provides? This provides identification of sender. How this provides? Because this the message which is encrypted by the secret key, which is not shared to anybody, only he knows. So if you get some message that is encrypted by his secret key, you can decrypt using this public key which is available with anybody and say that this message has come from A, okay, because it is encrypted with the A secret key. Similarly, message encrypted with the public key can only be decrypted with the corresponding secret key. Why the, where this is used? This is used to provide data confidentiality. How? Suppose I am I am the receiver and uh, I am the sender and uh, some A or B are the receiver. Okay, what I do is I know the public key of A and B. Okay, so I use their public key. I encrypt the plain text into cipher text using their public key and send it to A. Because once I encrypt with my public key, with the public key of A, it can be only decrypted with the public key of B. So, public key of uh, A, private, private, sorry, private key of A. So what it does, A will not share that private key with anybody. So A alone can decrypt, nobody others can decrypt that the information sent by me. So if you look at this feature of it, and if you look at the challenge in symmetric key, secure distribution of shared key, the key distribution can happen using this. Suppose node A and node B in an IoT network wants to share a secret information, then what will happen is node A can use the public key of B and share the key first. And using that key, the actual data can be shared. Then you might come across why should why can't we use public key itself for the data encryption? So it can be used. There is no uh, technically uh, impossibility is not there. Whereas the amount of resources that this public key takes is much more than the symmetry for the same amount of security that this provides. In uh, because of this, what will happen is. Most of the people use public key algorithms for the key exchange and uh, symmetric key algorithms for the session data encryption. Okay, that is the general usage scenarios. The examples of RSA, ECC, Diffie element key element algorithms are public key algorithms. And the next class of algorithms that we widely use in network security and the data security is hash functions. These are one way mathematical hash functions kind of provides fingerprint to the message. The output is always fixed. And for every small change in input, there is a different hash. It, it, the hash will never report, will repeat for two inputs. OK, that's the beauty of this function. So you cannot reverse it. Because it's a one-way function. Given the hash, you cannot get the plain text. OK, that's that's the properties of this function. And then let us see how digital signing will happen. So a sender wants to send a message. You will apply as which will be a fixed output message digest will come and then he, he encrypts that with the private key of the sender his own private key that will become digital signature so he sends message plus the digital signatures to the receiver here on the receiver side he has received message plus digital signature okay uh, receiver also applies the same as function onto the plain message that he has received and on the digital signature which is encrypted by the private key of the sender and the public key of sender is known to the receiver so he uses the public key of the sender and decryption so these two should match then only he will accept the message that he has received otherwise he will reject that 
So what these particular digital signatures will establish? It establishes identity and authenticity of the signer that is basically the sender because it has been uh, uh, it has been encrypted by the private key of the signer. And integrity of the document, if any modifications on the channel, this, this message would have been uh, actually modified. For any modified message, your hash will differ. So it also ensures the integrity of the document. And the third one which it ensures partially is the non-repudiation. Okay, what do you mean by uh, non-repudiation is inability to deny being signed. Okay, so what happens is sometimes the sender will say, uh, I have not uh, signed that because I lost my uh, private key or something. Okay, in that case, how do you ensure that? So to make sure like uh, sender will not do that, there is a concept called digital signature certificates that have come into picture. So once you have a public key, private key pair, your public key is digital signed by the certifying authority. And uh, as long as your certificate is valid, the third party will ensure like the data coming from a particular device with that public key. You will not say that uh, you, you will not say that yes, said that is the third party's role and responsibility. So that you can establish non-repudiation also using uh, digital signature certificates. So in a traditional internet, we are talking about HTTPS. How these algorithms are used? to basically secure the communication between two devices, okay? So let us see the basic flow. Initially, the user initiates a HTTPS connection request. For that, for uh, suppose if I started with uh, any uh, banking site, the banking site will send its uh, website digital certificate. That is basically public key of his uh, particular website. Okay, then the browser on the user side will actually validate it through the third, third party which assigns this certificate. Okay, so that is the second step. It once it validates, okay, it 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 knows the public key of it. Then it also actually negotiates the encryption algorithm that the data transmission happens between these two, like both browser on the user side. And also the server and the, and the, and the merchant side should support the encryption algorithm that they negotiate uh, uh, for the next session that is going to happen. Once this encryption algorithm is agreed upon, then what will happen is uh, then a secure socket will be opened by the server. The overall data that goes from from the user to the server from that point will go in an encrypted format in that uh, through that socket so that's how we could ensure like any intruder will not get anything out of it that's the reason https it, it, it provides reasonably good amount of security because it, it, it implements all identity authenticity and data integration everything so this is how your https works uh, using tls tls actually sits between uh, tls works on HTTP is become HTTPS. This is the basic uh, data, uh, basic flow that how you do a secure communication in internet, okay? When it comes to internet of things, okay, why can't we use the same is the question that we were trying to address. And we uh, said that all these RSA, AES, and all those algorithms to implement uh, it needs certain amount of program memory and certain amount of random access memory for the variables and all that. Generally, to implement all these hashing and then storing digital certificates and then public key algorithm for key exchange and then symmetric key algorithm for the secure communication, it needs heavy lots of memory and processing power required. So this this will also adds to the power consumption. All these will become uh, will make the device much more complex in IoT domain. So adapting straight away the HTTPS kind of scenario onto the IoT devices has to be carefully carefully thought about it based on the 
application that, that you are working on based on the solution that you are developing, whether your solution is worth considering such a complex devices as part of your monitoring system. And uh, accordingly, a balanced decision needs to be taken. But when we see most of the cases, uh, now IoT is in such a way that a lot of devices are already developed by various vendors. Okay, thinking that security is afterthought there, and some devices are under the hood. In that scenario, what is the optimum way to implement such security? Has to be thought about. Yes. Any good? Okay. So there is a, a group called Trusted Computing Group. Actually, they define uh, specifications for trusted platform modules. Okay, what this trusted platform module specification says, it is basically a chip specification that contains a random number generator for a key generation, an AS engine, and then uh, there are platform configuration registers for storing your AS values, sub suppose for secure booting and all. There are uh, secure storage for your uh, keys, and also it will have an RS engine, an AES engine. Okay, uh, over and all that, uh, all these security algorithms, how to use, will have a secure program code inside it. Okay, this is the specification it gives in for a chip. There's a difference that if all the things implemented in, in, in software and all the things implemented in a chip, the the if everything is implemented on the chip, the advantage that you get here is the power consumption will go down, and also the 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 speed at which you can encrypt, you can do key exchange will improve. All that advantages the chip wins. So that is the specification. It was defined uh, uh, in the first stages. Later they thought when they have to adapt to the various classes of devices that are already into the market where providing this chip onto the system is not possible, then they thought about four types of TPMs. One is the discrete TPM, trusted platform model, which we talked about, having a discrete chip. Okay, that is suggestible uh, if you are starting with a new design. Next is integrated TPM. As I said, more and more functionality is getting integrated into the, uh, into the silica because of reduction in transistor sizes. So you can, uh, along with your microcontroller or RF transceiver, you can also integrate the secure block inside your SOC there. So it will become kind of more of single chip system that you are talking about here. And the third one is for the devices that are already <coughs> into the market, they have actually defined a firmware based, same TPM, how to implement using firmware has been defined, and also uh, how to implement using software has to be defined. Whereas in case of firmware, you actually designate certain portion of execution environment as trusted execution environment, and your, your TPM code runs into the trusted execution environment. So the kind of applications and the kind of security each TPM brings, if you see discrete TPM, it brings highest security, even integrated gives higher, even though I said higher, it also gives highest uh, security. And uh, here is a tamper resistant hardware because what, what do we mean by tamper resistance is uh, in case the system is enclosed properly, if somebody tries to remove enclosure and somebody tries to read data through magnetic reader and all that stuff, this should detect and erase all the software. So nowadays, the SOCs which integrate integrated TPM are also providing tamper detection. So these two we can consider now almost equal with respect to the security that it provides with respect to the security features that they provide. And uh, see, when we see the first thing, the typical application is in critical systems, whereas in K2S integrated TPM. How may TPM, the security level that it provides is high and it, uh, it runs in uh, trusted execution environment, the cost of it is less. And it can be used in end devices. Software TPM doesn't provide much security, so it's it's not uh, worth considering to actually to, to truly secure the communication or device. And virtual TPMs are meant for the cloud environment. These are the classes and uh, where these TPMs can be used.
So let us look at one by one device security. If you see, you need to provide a tamper detection. So a tamper detection, how do you implement in exact hardware implementation or software implementation? You actually every every uh, SOC will uh, SOC or microcontroller will give you certain I/O pins as tamper pins because irrespective of your device is powered or not. They will they will run on RTC battery. Power. They will be unable to use RTC battery. Hello. So these pins are always active. So you have to connect. Hello. You you have to connect uh, the kind of uh, physical tamper loop detection. If somebody removes an uh, an enclosure, it should give an interrupt to this system. Similarly, somebody uses a, a magnetic reader that should be a done. So all types of tampers you need to connect to these I/O pins. Whenever such a tamper activity happens, this gives an interrupt to the microcontroller. Microcontroller wakes up and detects the tamper and removes all the code from the system so that the intruder, the, the guy who malicious guy who wants to take control of the software, will not be entertained. That's the tamper detection. How do we? And next is uh, to provide a secure device, you need to have a uh, secure booting mechanism. In the traditional systems, if you see, each layer of code uh, will have a uh, checksum calculated and stored into the hardware. So before running that, the system will once again uh, calculate the checksum and compare with already stored the checksum. Then only it, it allows the software to run. So we do at each layer, the, the bootloader and then OS core and all. When it comes to IoT devices, generally most of the devices might not have OS functionality implemented. So in those cases, what we do is, we basically uh, uh, keep the basic thing into the hardware registers and the application that comes, we check with respect, we, we do an as uh, function there and then uh, based on the matching of the assets that is already stored and the code that is running the microcontroller allows that code to run that's how you can say that the device security with respect to hardware tampering that with respect to the booting is taken care so the next important thing that we need to provide is the firmware over the aid update uh, here actually how do we implement uh, why do we need firmware over the update has been multiple times told, uh, maybe to actually feed the calibration constraints or uh, uh, to actually do a bug fixing, or it can be uh, in any other additional services integration into the device also. You need to do the firmware upgrades uh, for the devices that are already deployed. So what are the things that you need to, how do you do this firmware over there? See, there is, uh, if you see any embedded device or an IoT device, which is critically an embedded device, uh, you have a bootloader, primary bootloader, on reset, the microcontroller starts uh, executing from reset vector where bootloader is present. Then, to actually enable this firmware over the A, you need to actually make this bootloader to point to a second bootloader, secondary bootloader. Uh, where a secondary bootloader will provide this additional firmware feature. So, what do I mean by additional firmware? Suppose a, a, a program is running into your device already. If I want to program, if I want to flash another program, which is enhanced version of this program, what I will do is in the in the in the frames that I am sending for that particular device. I use a specific frame code for it that actually says that the incoming data is basically the application data that it has to be reflashed. So all this data with that frame codes that are specified with the specific frame codes will be stored in an, a memory that is separate from the <coughs> memory that is being executed currently. So once you actually sequence and store all these program, that new program that came up, then you can actually instruct your secondary bootloader to point to that particular location where this particular program is loaded and ask you to execute from that. That's how. Hello. That's how we actually you enable uh, over the air firmware upgrade. 
but one one basic requirement for this is you need to have an additional flash to store the second image because primary image is already running suppose if your image size is 100 kb let's think your microcontroller at least should have 250 kb of flash to actually store the secondary image also so that's how we provide device security and uh, if if uh, when we talked about tpm if you are architecting the device now not uh, using the available device you can actually think about putting an tpm chip or you can actually think about selecting a system on chip for that device which is having integrated tpm so if you choose like that you can actually provide uh, uh, required security in the iot devices also okay if not if if you already bought an uh, the systems that are already available in market and uh, how do you provide security you, i said uh, you have the other variant called firmware tpm as part of the earlier earlier uh, slide but once again the firmware tpm specification also is currently compliant to the protocols that we talked about like aes rsa and all they are all once again resource hungry protocols so we we looked at this problem some, some class of devices that are already deployed might not have those much memory to accommodate all these protocols all these functionality from a particular functionality so uh, we looked at uh, various uh, protocols this the guys uh, uh, nice from uh, university of luxembourg has looked at various protocols and then they have done an good uh, analysis on the program code size and the ram it requires for each each encryption algorithm for ARM Cortex M series, MSP based microcontrollers and AVR microcontrollers. Okay, so based on that, we picked uh, two popular protocols for lightweight cryptography, present and spec, and then uh, actually we analyzed further with respect to the power consumption with respect to the AES hardware block and AES software block, and also we implemented the uh, soft heating space HMAC for these IoT devices to compare with uh, the power consumption. So when we actually do this analysis, uh, if you see that uh, spec present and AES hardware software, uh, if you see overall time that these, these algorithms are taking, with key scheduling, it's about 207 microseconds. Yeah. Whereas AES hardware block is taking very less time. Encryption with, with key scheduling. Whereas uh, the amount of memory that these takes, AES is taking a little less than the spec, but spec is less than other two algorithms implemented in software. Okay. These values are measured with uh, at uh, 16 mega frequency and 3.6 volts power supply. So if you see this, this bar graph will say the memory usage. Basically, uh, the memory requirements of spec is very less, around 3K, present is about 8K. AES with uh, hardware is already existing in microcontroller is about 3K, software is about 12K. Then this is like uh, uh, encryption of time it takes. If you see the uh, AES hardware, it takes only 120 microseconds, whereas uh, spec takes about 200 microseconds. Okay. So, with uh, on your uh, left hand side, it's uh, time that it takes with key scheduling, and on right hand side, time without key scheduling is given here. So, based on this analysis, what we thought is, why can't why can't we actually look at developing a TPM? Okay, so we uh, evaluated these uh, lightweight algorithms and. Uh, we now de devised a mechanism to build a TPS equivalent with the lightweight algorithm so that the overall uh, memory, this overall TPM equivalent will take. And although the power consumption of it is very optimistic. So on the right hand side is the one which we have uh, developed using lightweight algorithms, a form of TPM. In the traditional TPM, uh, uh, we use TPS for uh, Asymmetric encryption, whereas here we uh, we are using spec. 
uh, RSA was used for the key exchange. Here we use the ECC and uh, SHA for the uh, message digest. Here, sponge based as functions, which are lightweight, has been used as part of the firmware lightweight TPM that has been developed. So, when we look at uh, the, uh, the flow that we have looked at earlier, and I would complete the data flow. Data flow. Uh, so we are planning to provide uh, the bottom two layers. One with the firmware-based lightweight TPM that has been developed, and also we have seen the TLS algorithm, HTTPS algorithm, how it works between the user and the. So uh, we have we have developed an algorithm using these lightweight uh, encryption algorithms, uh, of TLS protocol for the IoT examples. So both both uh, lightweight firmware TPM and lightweight TLS equivalent will provide optimized code fight uh, for for securing IoT edge devices. So if the gateway implements this lightweight firmware T TLS equivalent for the edge networks on one side. And the other side, it implements traditional HTTPS. That's how the complete data from the end device to the cloud or HTTP servers can be made secure uh, with optimal utilization of the resources. This is the thing. So uh, with this, what we can do is we can actually do an end-to-end -end, uh, secure communication from the physical world to the cyber world using these algorithms that are being described. I think uh, that is the end of my presentation. If any uh, questions, I am ready to take up now. Uh, participants, in case if you have any questions to be addressed to the resource person, you may kindly use the chat box and uh, type your questions. Uh, hello, sir. Nirmal here. Yeah. One yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what is the uh, efficient way to yeah. uh, uh, for security of the IOS, IoT devices? Because nowadays, as you I gone through the you know presentation that mm. we are uh, migrating to IoT devices like if we we'll call about you know home automation, everything we are controlling through. Uh, yeah. IoT devices by using the application. Yes, yes. So, uh, efficient way is suppose uh, I, I just said if you are building the device now freshly, you integrate a TPM as part of it. So, you can actually uh, apply the traditional HTTPS onto the communication. If not, if you are using a, a device that is already available, I suggest you to. Uh, build a firmware lightweight TPM equivalent using lightweight algorithms, which will meet all the resource requirements, so that you can you can you can secure the total IoT. And there's one more question on what do you mean by encryption and decryption? Uh, uh, I think the encryption in the encryption what what we do is we actually take a plain message and apply continuous mathematical operations. As I said in the AES case, we do four basic operations like uh, the AES basically works on 128 bits of blocks. So 128 bytes. The 128 bits is made as four into four matrix. Okay, yeah, uh, so you have shift rows one, one operation, whereas each row is shifted left and there's a, a random sequence we shift. And then mixed columns like uh, we apply XR operations with some fixed values on the columns. That is the second operation. And then third one is S box. So you you actually replace each each box in that four by four matrix with a substitution value which you get from a lookup table. It is basically a mathematical thing. And then after that you add, you generate a round key, add it to that. 
okay this is one round of ags block this will happen 10 times before you get the output of the encryption so what will happen you have given a plain message decoded in some format where your system supports uh, encoded into the format that will be subjected to these many mathematical operations to, to get an encryption output which we call it as cipher okay this this is a, a kind of looks like a junk data only the person who has key can only decrypt decryption means you will have similar operations in a reverse way and you should need the decryptor should need the key to do that that's what the decryption is then you get the plain message pardon me sir can you please repeat the question sir yeah yeah are we uh, using as you said the process and application for the security of the iot devices yeah. i just would like to know are we using practically nowadays uh, these applications or this is yet to be applicable in future no 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 we are using there are so many solutions onto the field cda itself as uh, agricultural solution <laughs> Because in some cases, IoT devices will see some of the times of the hardware failures, you know, due to attacks of you know, cyber attacks. Yeah, any, you know. Uh, the uh, hardware is really mature. Uh, yeah. uh, the hardware is really mature now. Uh, as I said, we ourselves have deployed uh, an underground network in the agricultural field. All the devices are working using solar based power systems. Okay, they actually communicate securely the data to the server in CDA. Okay, yeah. this solution is working for last four years without any problem. Yeah, if we talk, you know, if we uh, talk about the security, like nowadays, uh, every you know, like we see a lot of things uh, are uh, used by uh, not different countries' different systems. Uh, for the security of the defense. So there may be a chance of you know, uh, and would like that. Actually, uh, there are a lot of noise actually. Hello. Hello. I don't think it is from my side. Uh, somebody else actually, somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So in, in, in defense, it has got a lot of applications. Suppose if you want to, if you want to find out somebody is intruding the uh, border, you have the sensor-based techniques that can detect if somebody is coming or not. So all that kind of solutions can be developed for the defense. One is aware of is the surveillance. Second is other fence. You can put a lot of sensors to detect if anybody is crossing the fence and all. So such kind of applications are, are, are being developed for the defense. It's not only limited to this. So you can even uh, look at uh, each soldier can wear a small IoT device, which will uh, tell where is whereabouts so that, uh, and also uh, is movements and all so that we can clearly monitor that. Okay. So the next question in the chart is how do you, how does these keys are distributed between sender and receiver? Uh, as I explained, there's a public key system in which public key is announced to everybody, whereas private key is kept with them only. So suppose if I want to transfer key to you, I will use your public key and encrypt the key which I wanted to send and send it to you. Because, you, uh, 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 because I will send it on a common channel, everybody will receive that, but I have encrypted with your public key. You can only decrypt with your private key. That's how you receive key securely here. That's how the key exchange happens between sender and receiver. Okay, if I have to use sender and receiver, I'll repeat once again. The sender will send the key. He generates key using a random with number generator. And that key encrypt with the receiver's public key and transmits. So this will go on a common channel. Everybody receives it. But because it is encrypted using the receiver's public key, only receiver's private key can decrypt it. That's how receiver will decrypt using his private key and uses the key securely. That's the thing. Sir, uh, one person has asked about our public key is similar to private key. Basically, uh, public key and private key are related by a uh, relation. 
they are actually uh, uh, a large there are two large prime numbers okay i, I have not uh, given a simple explanation of uh, rsa but uh, these two are very large prime numbers and uh, the 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 private public key is derived from it n, n is the public key if you say uh, p and q are two large prime numbers n is equal to p into q is the public whereas uh, private key is uh, 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 some other equation is there which i forgot so there is a mathematical relation they are not they are uh, similar in size but uh, they are different and they are related mathematically uh, i would have put that rsa simple explanation but i, I missed it in the presentation is there any idea of internal security to work with it i did is there any idea of internet of things security to work with it we have explained this uh, internet of things security here saying that based on the basic uh, compute power basic memory available with the device you need to look at what kind of security that you built into it because you have to look at uh, resources plus the criticality of the application that you need uh, the critical security so based on that you have to take a call use firmware tpm or uh, uh, actually an uh, integrated tpm all that approach you can take if you feel like you still need encryption alone don't worry about tpm like a kind of thing use a simple uh, uh, what we can call it as a lightweight encryption and just do the encryption that is also possible there are lot of research going on in this area to further reduce size and size and some of the companies also had come up with very uh, lightweight algorithms to be used like they take only 15 kb of your memory uh, trusted objects and all have built already that such such uh, algorithms for iot security cryptography and digital signature cryptography is the method by which you you, you actually can uh, create digital signatures cryptography if you see this is the basic algorithms using mathematics you know, to provide security is the cryptography whereas digital signature is uses the cryptographic algorithms to provide authentication identification data integrity all that stuff so that's the difference between the digital signature is one layer above compared to the cryptography 